Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, through our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is our Gospel reading, the story of Jesus at the home of Martha and Mary. It begins with this verse, these words, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. This is the word of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. All of the comfort dogs in the comfort dog ministry, as soon as they begin their training, not only are they given a name, they are also given a Bible verse. And that Bible verse is actually part of their name. And our comfort dog, Gabriel, is no exception. His Bible verse is Hebrews 13, verse 2. And it is a verse that I have really grown to appreciate. It's the verse that says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. I think the writer to the Hebrews had our Old Testament reading in mind, the story of three visitors who came to the tent of Abraham. And Abraham showed hospitality toward them, and he was completely unaware initially that those three strangers were Jesus and two angels. But he gave good hospitality to these strangers who had come across his path. And in the ancient world, hospitality was important because they didn't have McDonald's and Motel 6s on every corner. And when strangers would travel, they often would need a place to eat and a place to rest. And so it was very common for people to open their homes to these strangers who were passing by and provide a meal and a bed for them just as Abraham was willing to do. Hospitality is what we are called to give. As Gabriel's verse reminds us, we are not to neglect that hospitality towards strangers because we never know when an angel might actually be crossing our path. And so we are called today to be hospitable, to be welcoming, to open our doors to those who have a need. We as a congregation are called to that life of hospitality as well because we live in a neighborhood full of primarily strangers, people whom we do not know, and yet we are encouraged by Scripture to be hospitable to them, to open our doors, to welcome them, to provide welcome for them in any reasonable way that we can here as the people of God in this neighborhood, to do anything else would be unchrist-like. To neglect hospitality would not be doing things the Jesus way. And so it is, as Jesus and his disciples are traveling, that they come into a certain village and there is a woman named Martha who, in very hospitable fashion, opens her home to Jesus. Well, hospitality in the ancient world was not easy because they did not have the modern conveniences of refrigerators and freezers and microwaves and ovens. So if you invited someone to have a meal, that meant a lot of work. We saw that with Abraham as he literally is running back and forth to make sure that food is being prepared for his guests while Martha is doing the same thing. Maybe it meant a trip to the market to purchase meat or other items for the meal that she needed to prepare. And of course she'd be cooking the meat, she'd have to bake bread, she'd have to prepare everything else because it wasn't sitting in a freezer waiting to be microwaved. There was no Tupperware to have leftovers stored in the refrigerator. So when Martha invites Jesus and maybe the rest of the disciples, the text is unclear on that, when Martha invites at least Jesus to her house, she wants to put on a good meal 
And so she's hard at work and she probably expected that her sister Mary would be helping her in the kitchen. But in the midst of Martha's frantic efforts to put a meal together fitting for this visiting rabbi, what is Mary doing? She's just sitting there. I picture, and this isn't found in the scriptures, but this is my speculation. I picture Martha as the older sister. You know, the one who was always responsible growing up, the one who, who was even responsible for her younger sister Mary's care. You know how it is being the older sibling when, when you go out and play with your, your younger brother or sister. Mom or dad says, now you keep an eye on him or her. You watch out, make sure that they're okay. You're responsible for them. And then, of course, Mary, being the younger child, in my little speculation here, well, she probably was doted upon and, and babied, and, and not a lot was expected of her. And who knows, maybe even some of that siblingness was now evident as these are grown women. And Martha is being super responsible and getting this meal put together, and Mary is just sitting there by Jesus. Well, Martha is so upset, so frazzled by this, that she stops everything that she's doing and she walks up to the two of them and she doesn't talk to her sister. No, she gets Jesus roped into this whole thing. Lord, don't you care that she's not helping me? Tell her to help me. You can hear the frustration in Martha's voice as she has been frantically trying to put a meal together and her sister isn't doing anything. And then Jesus says those words, Martha, Martha. And I don't think he was saying them in a patronizing manner. I don't think he was saying them in an angry manner, but when he says her name is Martha, Martha, take a breath. Just stop for a moment. You're so anxious about so many things. But you're, there's only one thing you need to worry about. And your sister Mary, she's chosen the good portion. Martha was so worried about making sure that there would be enough portions of food that she overlooked what Mary had discovered, the good portion. Mary wasn't just sitting there. Mary was listening to Jesus. And they weren't just talking about the weather and the local sports team or the kids in the neighborhood. No, Jesus was imparting God's word and wisdom to Mary. And Martha was missing out on that. So Jesus has to remind Martha not to be so distracted by everything else that she missed what was really important, the one necessary thing, the good portion. And Jesus goes on to say, no one's going to take that away from Mary. I'm not going to let you take her into that kitchen and miss out on my word. In fact, Martha, here's what I'd like you to do. Forget the kitchen. Have a seat. Listen to my word. Let me share with you God's wisdom. Let me teach you about the reign and rule of God in this world. Let me share with you the promises of God. Because that really is the one necessary thing. Now this doesn't mean that Martha was a bad person. Doesn't mean she was not a person of faith. In fact, we encounter the sisters on another occasion after their brother Lazarus has been dead for four days. And Jesus finally makes his appearance, even though he had been notified that Lazarus had been sick, Jesus delayed 
Lazarus died. And when Jesus and the disciples arrive at the home of Mary and Martha, it is Martha who greets Jesus. And she has this wonderful conversation with Jesus about the resurrection. And she confesses, I know I will see my brother again on the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this, Martha? And she makes her great confession. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ who was to come into the world. So Martha is a person of faith. But in this instance, her priorities got mixed up. You see, Martha and Mary viewed Jesus differently on that occasion. Martha viewed Jesus as a guest. Mary viewed Jesus as the host. Martha saw her role as the one to serve Jesus. Mary realized that Jesus really had come to serve her. And that more important than food for the belly was food for the soul. And that's what Jesus came to provide. That was the good portion that Mary was enjoying while Martha was busy putting together other portions of food. You see, that's the, the rhythm of our life with our Lord Jesus. As we come here to his house, not to serve him, but so that he can serve us. That he can fill our souls with his word. That we can partake of his supper, where we are the guests, and he is the host offering his own precious body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins. We come here to be served by Jesus. And then having been served and nourished by him, he sends us out where we encounter strangers and where we show them hospitality as we are taught to do. We show them Jesus unconditional love as we care for them as we pray for them as we pray with them as we speak to them the words of God's wisdom that we have received in this place and after a week of caring for other people we're pretty spent and that's why we come back here so that our souls can be nourished and refreshed by Jesus so he can serve us and show hospitality toward us and then we can go back out there again into the world for another week and spend ourselves in hospitality and love and care for others and then come back here to receive from Jesus and go out there to give to others and come back here to receive from Jesus and go out there to give to others. That is the rhythm of the life of a follower of Jesus. We let him serve us. And then we serve him by how we serve others around us. That's what we are called to do as his people. That's what we are called to do as this congregation. I always like those Motel 6 commercials. Got Tom Bodet with his good old boy voice always promising you at the end of the commercial, we'll leave the light on for you. That was Motel, Motel 6's way of speaking hospitality. We'll leave the light on for you. We know that Jesus is the light of the world and his light shines for us. And when we come into his light, we are refreshed and we are nourished. But Jesus also says to us, you are the light of the world. So we take the light that Jesus shines upon us with his grace and his mercy, and then we reflect that light 
into the lives of others. We are their Motel 6. We are their place of hospitality as Jesus would have us show hospitality. That's hospitality the Jesus way. Letting him serve us so that we can in turn serve others. God grant it for Jesus' sake. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our light. Amen. <laughs>